If you're relatively new to the channel, first of all, thank you and welcome. You might think that I just do glitch in the Matrix stories, and I do a lot of them, but from time to time I like to sneak in other types of stories too. This video, I've included some paranormal stories, and those start at about the halfway mark, around 30 minutes. I hope that you stick around for those stories in the second half of the video as well. Alright, so check this out. The first time my daughter read my mind. My mom, my daughter, and I tend to do this a lot. I always laughed when my mom or I would answer unspoken questions, thinking we were just really tuned in to each other. My daughter had just turned two. She could speak fairly well and was pretty understandable. She was taking a bath while we were staying for a visit at my parents' new house. I was sitting by the tub, keeping her company, and I was thinking to myself, I wonder what the new neighbors are like. Maybe they have kids. What was the name of the little girl next door at the old house? Ah, she was so cute. What was her name? Just then, my daughter stopped playing in the tub, looked at me, and said, Jolie, Jolie, Jolie. And yeah, that was the little neighbor girl's name. I know that I didn't speak my thoughts out loud, and I know that I didn't speak these thoughts out loud because my daughter had a running dialogue as she played with her mermaid in the bath. How do you think she was able to know exactly what I was thinking? I saw that my ex-co-worker announced she was going to have a girl. She didn't know the gender until birth, and now the post doesn't exist. I feel like I'm losing my mind. My former co-worker has two boys. She became pregnant with her second baby boy while we still worked together, and before she knew the gender, she would talk about how she hopes it's a girl, as this will be their last baby. Well, he was a beautiful little boy, and she was head over heels. Fast forward six years later, we're still friends on social media, and late last year, she announced that baby girl that she had even given a name to was coming July 24th. It was written in chalk with her boys in the picture. I even told my husband, oh yay, she's having a girl. I know she's always wanted a girl. Well, a couple days ago, she had her baby girl. Absolutely perfect. But she wrote, Finding out the gender at birth was the most magical experience I'll ever have gone through in life, and I'm so grateful. And now I'm thinking, uh, what? So, I went back, and her announcement post was the exact same picture that I remember seeing, but not the pink chalk or anything that indicated a baby girl. Even in the comments, people were asking, do you know the gender? And she'd respond, no, we're going to wait this time. It's our last baby, and we want to experience the surprise. And I know I'm not confusing her with anyone else either, as no one else is going through the two boys and then the one girl scenario. I have two older brothers, and I always smile every time knowing how fun it was having two big brothers. I also have two boys myself, so it's fun to think about a possible daughter one day. I'm tripping out. It was so weird, and she's not the type to want attention or act like she didn't know when she did. I even told my husband all of this, and he confirmed I told him that she was having a girl. So, yeah, my friends, I'm thinking I finally experienced a big glitch in the Matrix. It wasn't my grandfather's body in the casket. This happened last year. 
My grandfather's health had been declining from dementia for several months until one day he just dropped dead on the floor at home. Despite how sudden it was, he went peacefully. I hadn't seen him since Christmas, almost a full year prior, and even though he didn't look so great, he was completely recognizable as him. Then, the day of the funeral came, and I hesitated to get close to his body. It was my first time, at least as an adult, having a family member die, and it just felt, I don't know, more bleak than my other grandparents who died when I was a kid or a teen. Eventually, I couldn't avoid it anymore, and my mom led me to the casket. When I saw his face, it wasn't his. It was mine. His hair, his nose, his bone structure were all gone and replaced with my own features. I was staring at my own dead body lying in that casket, and no matter how many times I rubbed my eyes or looked away, it never changed. I don't look like my grandfather. For starters, I'm a woman. My face is thinner, my jaw has a completely different shape, and my nose is pretty unique. Granted, I do have short hair, a bit like his, but it's not the exact same. But it was, undeniably, me lying in that casket. Not someone who looked like me. It was me. I left the casket and began talking with family members. Every so often, I'd go back to see if something had changed, though it was always the same. No one else mentioned it, and I was honestly too scared to say anything myself, so I thought I must be the only one seeing me lying in the casket. In all likelihood, it might have been a hallucination of some kind. Maybe it was some sort of stress response that my brain just created in the moment. But it's odd that nothing else was affected by the hallucination. Not a single thing seemed out of the ordinary. I mean, aside from my body being in the casket. I don't know what it means, but it freaked me out. Hey, it's me. I want to take a minute to talk about Magic Mind. It's this daily liquid shot that I've been taking for, I guess, over a month now. And there's a few things that I love about this drink and this company that I wanted to share with you now. The first thing is the taste. You might not like the taste of these organic, all green drinks, and I don't blame you, man. Some of them just don't taste good. But you choke it down anyway because, you know, it's good for you. The thing about Magic Mind is that I actually enjoy the taste. I don't dread drinking it every single day, and I don't feel like I have to hold my nose when I do it. I actually like it. I love that you know what all the ingredients are, which include ashwagandha, turmeric, and lion's mane. One cool thing about lion's mane is that it's been studied for its potential in treating various health conditions, including depression, anxiety, and Alzheimer's. Some studies have also suggested that lion's mane may have neuroprotective properties and may help support nerve function as well. Another thing that I love about Magic Mind is that you can try it to get the same effects that I get from it at a deep 20% off discount right now. Visit magicmind.com slash scary stories and use this code for 20% off. It's scary stories 20. That's scary stories 20. That website and the code is at the top of the description in this episode just to make it as easy as possible for you. And not only do they have a 100% no questions asked money back guarantee, they also donate a portion of the sales for every bottle sold to mental health charities and services that assist in impoverished and homeless communities within the US. Let's do some good for ourselves and others now.
looking for something and I heard it being put back when no one was home. I've never forgotten about when I lived in UAE. Many strange things would happen, but one I remember vividly. I had a universal charger. I was looking for it for days and days. I know it wasn't in the wall. It was nowhere. In the dead of the night, no one was home. It was pitch black and nobody was in my room. I heard the charger being put back into the wall in the exact place that I thought I had left it days ago. When I woke up, I was really too scared to look, but lo and behold, I did, and it was there. Things like this just happened many times to me, and they always have. The weirdest thing happened to me at my daughter's volleyball game. My daughter, who's 14, had her first volleyball game today. The first round, the opposing team won, but the second round, my daughter's team won, and they tied. Or so I thought. Halfway through round three, my other daughter, who's 12, just two years younger, who accompanied me to her sister's game, asked me what round we were in. I tell her that we're in round three. She looks at the scoreboard and tells me that, oh, the board says round two. WTF? It does say round two. The fact that she even asked me when she knew what the board meant was baffling to me. Like, she experienced something weird, too, that provoked the question. But she denies it. She says, it ain't that deep, mom. Which is what she usually says when she avoids talking about something uncomfortable for her. Anyway, I distinctly remember round two happening. It was memorable because it meant we were tied. Another thing is the way the scoreboard works. The board operator has to manually turn back the numbers on the control board to reset the score for a new round. So, on the board on the wall, you'll see the numbers turn back down. 25, 24, 23, you get it. All the way back to zero, which I remember happening. I remember everyone cheering and the girls congregating around their coaches waiting for the third round for the tiebreaker. But it couldn't have happened. We were still in round two. We did win the second round both times that I experienced it. Luckily, I either saw the future, experienced a glitch in the matrix, or I'm as crazy as my 14-year-old suggests. Any thoughts? Interesting story. Seven years ago, I was moving away from North Dakota when me and my family were loading a Penske truck that we bought with all of our stuff. We had this trunk full of my mother's jewelry, some of my jewelry, my dad's coin collections, family photos, and some other things that we deemed valuable. When we were inside our house, the trunk was stolen out of the back of our moving truck. We were all, I mean, understandably, very sad because the jewelry, the coins, the heirlooms, all the valuable stuff, including family photos, were lost. But we didn't really think we could do anything, so we just finished packing and moved on to South Dakota. My grandfather lives a few hours north of us in South Dakota. He called and said that he found a trunk full of all that stuff in the attic. We drove up later that week and it was the same trunk that we thought was stolen. And even better, everything was still there. My granddad says that he doesn't know how it got there and he doesn't remember us or him putting it there. But, I mean, that could just be because he's 85. 
My only explanations are that the trunk never really got stolen and that my grandfather accidentally took it when he was helping us get settled into our new home. Or, and I know this one's kind of a stretch, but maybe there's an identical trunk that was full of my grandfather's stuff that got stolen out of the back of our moving truck and we never actually had the trunk with the jewelry or the pictures in the first place. It's probably not supernatural, but it is an interesting story nonetheless. Seeing my brother twice. This is an event that happened a few years ago now and was a rather short occurrence, but it still baffles me to this day. One night, I was walking up my stairs and I saw my brother walking into his room like he usually does if he's looking for me or just wants to come annoy me. Going up the stairs still, I kept my eyes fixed on the corridor just outside my room and not once did I see him come back outside my room again. I entered with a bit of caution and I expected him to be hiding around the back of the door or something to try and jump scare me as I entered but literally no one was in my room. There's no other way out of my room than the bedroom door and I kept my eyes fixed on my door so I would have 100% would have seen him leave again. His room is directly opposite mine, so I decided to go in and ask him what he was doing in my room just now. He was sitting in his computer chair, oblivious, and in a completely different outfit to what I saw him in as I was watching him walk into my room just a moment ago. This all happened in the span of like 20 to 40 seconds, so there was no chance that he managed to sneak past my view change clothes without making any noise and pretend like he was messing with me, especially as my eyes never left my door after I saw him enter it. I still don't understand what that was, but it really did seem like a glitch in the matrix to me. <laughs> Happened twice in our house. I'll try to keep this as short as I can. A couple of years ago, my dad stayed the night at our house. Our spare room at the time had internet equipment in it, and when I was setting up the room, I put black electrical tape over the flashing lights as they were quite obnoxious in the small room in the dark. A while later, when he was ready to go to bed, I walk in and I see no tape. I freaked, and my dad and husband thought I was losing my mind. I was pregnant, and maybe they thought I was sleep-deprived. I did lay in bed later that night, questioning a lot of things and terrified that I was losing my mind. Fast forward to the next day, we all get up and we're sitting in the living room when my husband goes to check just out of curiosity and comes back white as a ghost. There was the tape, slightly dusty from our slightly dusty floors as if it had been there all night long. And my dad, who's very level-headed, just brushed it off like he wanted to be done talking about it. Fast forward to tonight. I have two toddlers and after dinner, I'm exhausted and I go lay down in our bedroom. I'm in one of those sleep trances, dozing off, like, you know, when you're not fully asleep and you can still kind of hear what's going on around you. My husband came back and asked me through the door if I needed a hug. The door was locked, by the way, just to keep the toddlers out. And I remember being slightly annoyed and finding it a little off that he woke me up to ask me that. Told him I was fine, just tired and then I dozed back off. Fast forward about an hour, and he's back at the door, waking me up, asking if I got his text messages. 
I look at my phone and I see lots of supportive text messages with heart emojis and gifts and stuff. Now, I'm confused, and he's looking at me terrified and a little freaked out, and he swears that he heard me crying from the bedroom from behind the door. He said it was very distinctly my cry, and he thought something was bothering me, and I was keeping it from him. It took me a full half an hour to convince him that I wasn't crying, at least to my knowledge, and typically if I cry in my sleep, I wake up still crying. It took me 30 minutes of hardcore convincing him that I wasn't crying, and nothing was wrong before I think he started to finally believe me. Now, I'm definitely awake, and we're both freaked out, wondering if it's this house or maybe an entity that he heard. All I can think of is just about how every horror movie starts, and now I'm slightly terrified for my family's safety in this house. Lighter thrown back. I'm so happy that I found this subreddit. This incident has baffled me for years, and I still think about it pretty often. I'm glad that I have a place to share it to. Texas, summer, 10 years ago. It's hot as hell in a single wide with AC units not working worth a damn. I'm standing in the kitchen arguing with my dad. The argument started getting pretty heated and he gets a cigarette and when he went to light it, the lighter wasn't firing. So out of anger, he threw it out of the kitchen window and stormed past me to take a shower. As I was sitting there, looking out the kitchen window, eating my food, a lighter gets flung through the window and lands on the floor right next to me. I hopped up and I looked out the window, but I didn't see anyone. We hardly had neighbors, and the ones we had really weren't the friendly type that would just come on the property. I pick up the lighter, and I'll be damned if it lights up. I stand there, looking at it, and I see it's full of lighter fluid. It's the same exact lighter that my dad had earlier, thrown in the same way, but now it's been returned full. Can someone explain to me how does this happen? The lid of our pan just flew midair and shattered in the ground. I'm no science guy, but something weird just happened. A scientific explanation would ease my mind, but until then, I personally count what happened here as an actual glitch in the matrix. I was preparing our dog's meal. At the same time, I'm cooking something in a pan. I was on my way back to the living room with my dog's food when I saw the pan lid fly midair and then shatter into the ground. Again, I have no idea about the physics or anything involved with this, and the glass fragments were on the floor, but the black plastic slash rubbery part that you used to hold the lid was missing. We cleaned and searched the whole area, but we couldn't find it. It couldn't have just broke into pieces as well. I don't know, man. It's been a pretty wild morning for me since then. This story was submitted to Derek Weber Submissions at gmail.com from somebody named Esther. They say, Hi, Darren. I have several glitches in the Matrix experiences, and I'm happy to share this one with you. I swear on both of my parents' graves, or to whatever God you may believe in, that this story is absolutely true with no embellishments or stretch of the truth. I own an 80-acre farm in the country in South Mississippi. 
I've been told by city dwellers that I live so far away from town that they must have to pump sunshine out to me. When I pull out of my mile-long driveway, if I go left, I'm 15 miles from a town, and if I go right, it's 20 miles to the smaller town. On this day, I went left. There are two different tobacco stores in this town, and I'll go to one of them on one side of town, or the other one on the other side of town, depending on where else I'm going to on any given day. But on this particular day, I drove to the smaller tobacco store on the south side of town. This is the one that I go to the most and have been doing so for, I don't know, probably 10 years. I pulled up outside the store and parked and got out of my car, but as I was walking up to the door, something looked strange. I didn't put it all together until I tried to pull the door open, but it was locked. I wondered why the door would be locked. I've never known this store to close for lunch or anything, so I kept my hands on each side of my face and leaned on the glass front to see if I could spot anyone inside. I was shocked to find that the store had gone out of business. All the counters were gone, as well as all of the merchandise. I stood there, staring inside for what seemed like a long time. Confused, I thought maybe I had gone to the wrong storefront. So I stepped out to the sidewalk and checked the name above the door. But it was the right one. The shoe store was on my right and the grocery store was on my left, just they had always been. I shook my head in disbelief as I walked back to my car to go to the other tobacco shop. How could they possibly have gone out of business? Well, a few days later, my best friend Amy was going to town, so I caught a ride with her. When we got to town, I asked her if she would run by the tobacco store with me, but I told her the one on the south side was closed and out of business, so let's go to the other one on the north side. She then informs me that the one on the south side was in fact not out of business because she was just there yesterday. I was shocked and I asked her if she was certain that this was the shop that she had gone to and she said, yeah, she was positive. And she was right. We pulled up out front of the shop and I had my door open before the car had come to a full stop and I hurried inside. I was so confused. I know it was closed and emptied out just a few days before and I was going to prove it to Amy. As soon as she caught up to me, I asked the cashier inside what was going on the other day when I stopped by and they were closed. It looked like the shop was completely cleaned out, I said. Well, the cashier looked at me like I was crazy and told me that they've never closed their doors during business hours. I asked if maybe they did some kind of spring cleaning and she was just off work that day, but she informed me that she had worked every single day that week and they were never closed, nor were the doors ever locked. All I can really figure is that I was caught up in what's known as a glitch in the matrix, or maybe I had switched timelines momentarily and switched back. This was not the first time something like this happened to me either. What do you think about this? Okay, let's get spooky. The most haunted road in New Jersey is Clinton Road. Been lurking here for a while and finally decided to post my encounter as I'm somewhat new to Reddit. It might be a little long, but it's worth it. This was a couple of years ago. I was still in college. I worked at my local high school in South Jersey on the night shift for some extra money. But unfortunately, the hours meant that I really didn't get to have a life during the week. I get a call from my friend group on a Friday before I headed into work 
saying they were going to explore Clinton Road, which was known to be the scariest road in New Jersey. Obviously, I couldn't go, so I told them to let me know how they made out. Later in the night, I get a call from them in a panic, saying all these crazy things happened to them. They described what happened to them, how they threw coins over the Ghost Boy Bridge, and they came back, a ghost truck following them, and the feeling of being watched. I thought they were just hyping it up because I missed out, so it was decided that we'd all go out together again the next night. But this time, I got to see it for myself, something that I'd regret for the rest of my life. Us being from South Jersey, Clinton Road is a bit of a drive for us. It's about two hours, so there was plenty of time for us to get all hyped up and spooked out. Now, I can only describe myself as the manly man of the group. I was 6'5", about 260 pounds, and especially back then, I had this persona of, ah, it's just all made up. Nothing will scare us. But boy, was I wrong. Right when we get there, the entire vibe changed from, oh, we're all going to be spooked, to, oh wait, this is actually pretty damn creepy. The road is in the middle of the woods, houses few and far between. The first thing we see when we get there is a small, mini castle looking building is the best way I can describe it. And because of the far ride, we all had to pee. So I went to the left, Joe went straight, and Hare went to the right. Our last friend that joined us was female. She stayed behind us in the road. After I was done, I immediately walked back along with Hare but we noticed Joe walking towards the creepy castle building. I start shouting, asking what he was doing, and he turns back around with a look of pure shock. Me being completely confused, I ask, what are you doing walking over there? And Joe swore up and down that I was actually behind the building, waving at him to follow me behind the building. So, naturally, we're all getting really freaked out. We pull up to the Ghost Boy Bridge, and I check everyone for coins to make sure that they don't fake it just to scare me. We all throw the coins, and nothing happens. Ah, see guys? It's all in your head. Let's go. So we all start walking back to the car, but then I hear cling, cling, cling. I hear the coins hit the road. We sprint back to check and we find the coins laying in the road. I was still 100% convinced that somebody in the group was just messing with me. So I had the idea to mark a coin so that they couldn't fake it. I threw the coin in the water, waited five minutes in silence, nothing. See guys, let's get out of here. On the way back to the car again, cling, cling, cling. I hear coins hit the road. I walk back, and I'll be damned. It was the coin with the exact same markings that I put on it before I threw it in the water. At this point, we're all extremely freaked out, so we decide to go. Driving down the windy road in a newer sports car, we're all freaked out and just want to leave. We see headlights appear behind us, seemingly out of nowhere. I didn't see them attached to a vehicle. Now, I'm no car expert, but I bet my life that they were lights on an old truck getting closer the faster that we went, taking bends at fast speeds that even a new truck shouldn't be able to handle. And suddenly, the lights disappear. So, now all in panic, we decide to pull over and map our way out. 
There's dead silence and no light except for our headlights shining into the woods. And we hear this typical woman ghost moan. You know what it sounds like. And of course, what came with it was the typical woman in white dress standing in the woods right next to our car, and she let out the loudest scream I've ever heard. We're screaming at this point, all of us just trying to get out of Dodge. Once we make it back to the main roads, we decide to dig a little deeper on this road. Apparently, the ghost truck tries to make people crash on what's known as Dead Man's Curve. There have been numerous bodies buried there from the famous murderer called the Iceman. On our way home, we were so ballsy and wanted to go back again the next night, which would have been Sunday night. We suddenly pass an old, rundown church that looks like it hasn't been visited in 50 years. And of course, the sign left out front that read, You need Jesus on Sunday. Safe to say, I never went back. And even up to this day, the friend group still refuses to talk about what happened that night on Clinton Road. A succession of eerie events at my college house in Savannah, Georgia. It was my junior year of college, and I had procrastinated the renewal of my lease. When I realized that I couldn't continue living at my current house, I had scant options. Luckily, some co-workers offered me their upstairs game room for $400 a month. This was a stark difference to my previous $900 a month rent, so I jumped at the opportunity. It was only supposed to be for a four month stint, and by January, I would be moving back downtown with some college friends. The residence was in Montgomery, about 18 minutes away from Savannah proper. The house itself was a dark brick home with two levels and a large yard, which backed up to a swampy stretch of land. The property was inundated with oak trees, draped with Spanish moss. You get the idea. My roommates were substantially older than me. However, they were still fun to hang out with. One night, we were playing poker in the kitchen when we all heard a loud banging at the door. It sounded like someone was trying to enter the house, but the door was locked. We all thought that it was our roommate, Kyle, and that he had just forgotten his keys. I promptly got up from the table to let him in, but when I opened the door, no one was there. I looked around outside, but all I saw was an empty yard. I went back to the table and my roommates remarked how they too thought someone was trying to get in. While I was somewhat confused, I didn't think much of it and we continued our card game. A few weeks later, my roommate Sean had picked up a bottle of Jameson and after a brunch shift at the bar, Sean, Billy, and I decided to day drink. We were sitting at the kitchen table and had already polished about a quarter of the bottle. We were talking about work, laughing, and taking shots. Then, abruptly, the three of us were prompted to look at the linoleum countertop. I don't know what prompted us, but when I peered over my shoulder, I saw a bowl glide across the counter in a stifled manner. It was as if a frail finger was pushing it toward an indifferent destination. My eyes shot back to Sean and Billy, and their mouths hung agape with shock. We started laughing again, but it was the type of nervous laughter one experiences while in danger. Y'all saw that too, right? said Billy. 
We reassured him, and then I walked over to the countertop. I rubbed my hand over its surface, expecting it to be damp, but it was bone dry. There was no breeze, no invisible string, no magician in the cubert. It was honestly unsettling, but we laughed it off, and we went back to drinking. A month or so passed, and it's now October. My parents drove down from North Georgia to visit and brought Duke, our blue healer, with them. We walked around River Street, ate at Vicks, went to the candy kitchen, the whole shebang. After dinner, my parents told me that their hotel wasn't cool with pets, and they wanted me to keep Duke overnight. I was all for this, and I agreed. When Duke and I were dropped off at the house, I brought him inside. He played with my roommates for a while, and when it got late, we went up to the game room. My bed was awkwardly placed in the room's corner, and it faced two large windows on the wall opposite to me. At some point, I fell asleep with Duke curled up at the foot of the bed. Now, I'm a very heavy sleeper, and not much will wake me up. Yet, out of a deep sleep, I awoke to this low, guttural growl. Moonlight shone in from the windows, and I saw Duke standing up. His heckles were raised, and this guttural growl, which I had never heard before, persisted. He was looking up at something something I couldn't see. Whatever it was, it seemed to be lingering over the bed. I instantly felt uneasy, and I grabbed the dog and pulled him close to me. This seemed to lull his aggression, and I somehow found my way back to sleep. When November rolled around, I decided that I'd be attending my family's Thanksgiving in North Georgia. Our house is on a small cattle farm in LJ, and it's especially nice in the fall. I drove up and visited for a couple of days. On one afternoon, I felt overwhelmingly tired, so I went up to my room and took a nap. But when I awoke, I couldn't move. I felt my forehead beating with sweat and from the corner of my eye, I could see my mirror positioned above my dresser. And what I saw in the reflection induced pure terror. An old woman, pale, bony, damp, lingered over me. She had jet black hair, and she exuded an energy of just apprehension and malice. At this point, I'm freaking out, struggling to break free from this, you know, apparent sleep paralysis, and after a few moments, I did snap out of it. My heart was racing, and I leapt out of bed, and the woman was nowhere to be seen. December was my final month at the house, and one evening, my roommates and I were taking turns playing chess. I don't remember how we got on to the topic, but we brought up death and dying. Billy then asked Sean about the woman that used to live in the house. Sean was a no-nonsense type, honest to a fault, and as far from sensational as a person could be. He paused for a second and looked at me. Then he told the story of the previous owners, which was relayed to him by one of our neighbors. There was an older couple who had previously resided there. The gentleman had severe dementia, and his wife was his primary caretaker. One day, the man was found walking around the neighborhood, and a neighbor returned him to his house. When they got inside... The neighbor was met with a rancid stench in the air. He called for the man's wife, but there was no response. Concerned, the neighbor looked for her throughout the house, and when he got to their bedroom, the stench was even more overwhelming. In the bed, the old woman laid dead. 
she had passed away and remained in that bed for a prolonged period of days. I got cold chills when I heard this story for the first time, and I couldn't help but think back to that odd sleep paralysis episode and all of the other oddities that occurred in the house. I no longer live there, and the home has since been sold. Perhaps it was all unrelated anomalies and tricks of the subconscious, though in all honesty, I think something otherworldly was at play in the kitchen, the halls, and the bedrooms of that house in Montgomery. Sentient Haunting About 12 years ago, I moved into my house. It's an upper masonette that was built around the turn of the century, 1910 or thereabouts. When I first moved in, I lived with my brother, and we began to notice some strange things. Firstly, windows that we swore we'd closed were wide open. Not that strange, I suppose. Mistakes can be made. But it happened so often that we decided to do an experiment. We closed and locked every window in the house and then took the bus into town. We spent a few hours shopping and then came home. When we got back, all of the windows were unlocked and wide open and a stack of plates from the kitchen cupboard were on the counter. The phenomena continued. Wet handprints appeared on the ceiling in the kitchen and bathroom. Handprints appeared on the outside of the windows, and not long after, blood started to appear on the floors and walls. It ranged from splashes, where it looked like it could have been flung, to even small pools on tables and on the floor. Once, my brother's partner's train tickets home that were in his wallet turned up on the living room floor in a small pool of blood. We absolutely could not explain what was happening. A friend of ours, who was a nurse at the Royal Victoria Infirmary in Newcastle upon Tyne, took a swab of the fluid and confirmed that it was indeed human blood. Type A. Another time, when my brother and I were watching television in the living room, we could smell smoke, and it took us a long time to discover that the underside of our dining room table was on fire. No flames, but the wood was smoldering, like a red hot ember. We had to turn the table over and cover it with wet towels before we went to bed. The blood continued to materialize at regular intervals and we also started to discover some purposeful placement. On opening the bathroom cupboard, there would be stacks of jars and bottles of shampoo, cosmetics, and stuff like that, balanced so precariously that just a simple touch would cause them to collapse. One morning, I woke up and found every knife from the cutlery drawer in the fridge. Now, by this point, my brother had moved out and I decided to call a priest. Unfortunately, he seemed quite disinterested and said he could only offer the same blessing he would bestow on any new home. The phenomena did not stop. In fact, it got more frequent. I sent an email to the Society for Physical Research, but received no reply. At last, my mother, who was a very devout woman, said she knew of a priest who was mandated to deal with these sorts of things. I contacted him and you know, funnily enough, when he arrived, I recognized him. 
He had baptized my friend's eldest daughter and also said mass at the school that I attended. He assured me that whatever was happening wasn't dangerous and that I could not be harmed. He went from room to room with holy water as one might imagine. Then he held my hand and sang a prayer, which I believe was improvised. Before he left, he stuck a piece of laminated paper above my kitchen door that bears just a series of letters and numbers. I have no idea what they mean. He wouldn't take any money from me either. We shook hands and he left, and there's never been any activity since then. I saw something that I can't explain. When I was 10 years old, I saw something that to this day, six years later, I still can't understand at all. Me and my friends were outside playing, enjoying our time together, and for some added context, the area that I live in has one-way access meaning the way you come in is the same way that you have to go out. On this random day with my friends, Nate and Donnie, we saw an old school, completely white, double-decker bus drive past the road that we were walking on, and we just stood still in utter confusion because the way this bus came into our area was impossible it physically couldn't drive into the area without driving through the entrance first, and it definitely did not do this. Inside of the bus, there was two people, a male driver, dressed as if he was in the 1920s, and he was strangely completely white, like pale skin. He also had snow-colored hair with all white clothes, but he wasn't the most interesting person on the bus. There was a woman, extremely similar to him in that she completely was all white as well, but she was a passenger and she was acknowledging us by waving at us. I was completely dumbfounded. I mean, I just stood there in awe. I know it doesn't sound like much of a spectacle, but I can't explain the way this bus just had an aura that was completely captivating. These people on the bus didn't seem threatening at all. They seemed pretty benevolent, benevolent <laughs> and had a feeling of warmth about them. This whole situation must have lasted maybe five seconds at most. It was a lot to take in in such a short amount of time and out of nowhere, as the bus drove past us, it just suddenly disappeared. I can't explain it. Like, it didn't fade away. It just disappeared. I hadn't told anyone this story until I recently told my mom. And unlike me, she's very much a believer in the supernatural. And she told me that around the same time, she had a dream about her late mother that died the month before I was born, saying to her that she has to go and that she has a bus to catch. I know it's a far-fetched theory to assume that it was my grandmother, and I don't even know if I believe it in all honesty, but all I do know is that I definitely saw something that day, and whatever it was, it wasn't normal at least not the way we know normal. Does anyone with more knowledge on these supernatural things have any theories on what me and my friends saw that day? My two friends and I saw a ghost train. So, this was about six years ago, around... January, I believe. I was with two of my lifelong friends, and we decided to go do something before we all shipped off to the military. I was going to be the first to ship out a few months after this. 
and we started off hanging out at one friend's grandma's house. We eventually got bored and drove down to this river kind of back in the mountains in West Virginia. So the way this is set up, we had the road up the hill and then a small patch of woods to walk through then it opened up to a railroad track. Below the railroad track, down a steep gravel hill, was the riverbank. So, it was dark, and we parked the car on the road and walked down to the river crossing the railroad. We didn't really have a plan. We just built a small fire on the riverbank and sat around repeating inside jokes and laughing about dumb stuff we did when we were younger. We couldn't have been there for longer than 15 minutes when we heard a man yelling. Though we couldn't make out any words, the yelling sounded like he was yelling in a defensive manner. So we looked around but couldn't see anything. We heard it again and decided to stomp out the fire and just sit there quietly to listen. After a few minutes go by, we decided to pack up and leave. We made our way up the steep gravel hill, which was so steep we basically had to crawl up it, to the railroad tracks. We got to the top where we were about to cross the tracks, but we heard the sound of an engine getting closer. We decided to get on our bellies and wait the train out. We didn't want to get caught on railroad property, because it's a no trespassing area. Anyway, we saw lights coming and we even see smoke coming from the engine, which is weird since they don't use steam engines anymore, but at the time we thought nothing of it and we kept waiting. We waited for maybe 30 seconds to a minute when we heard the same noise from earlier. We looked around and again, we see nothing. When we turned back, the train was no longer headed towards us, it was just gone. We saw that it was clear and we crossed the tracks, went back up to the hill through the woods and just slept in the car. We ended up leaving in the morning and never really thought much of it. Then the next evening, one of us finally brought up how weird it was that a whole entire train just disappeared and we questioned why we didn't just leave. Fast forward to two to maybe three years later, I was in the military at this point and was back home in West Virginia for leave. I went to a bookstore with my dad and brother and I went to the horror section. I saw a subsection with local books. I picked one up that was called I don't know, something along the lines of West Virginia Legends? I don't remember the exact title. I flipped past a few pages and landed on one section called Ghost Trains in West Virginia. I immediately closed the book and put it back down. The weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life and we still talk about it to this day and I really don't know why we thought nothing of it at the time until the next day because, in all honesty, that was an extremely weird thing to have happened. Also, note that the way this particular track was set up. The way it ran was parallel to the river and the road going around the mountain. There was no fork in the tracks and it couldn't have turned anywhere due to being right in between a road slash mountain and a river. Let me know what you guys think. I'm not really sure how a train can be a ghost. I sent this encounter into a paranormal podcast and they said that we could have been in some kind of time slip, but I really don't know. I'm not super into paranormal stuff, but I would love to hear some opinions about what you guys think that it could have been.